speak to our hearts. Let your word will enrich us and make us bear fruit accordingly in Jesus' name. We are asking that the words that we will hear will be mixed with faith and it will produce fruit. Thank you, Father. Take away unbelief. Take away resistance. Prepare our hearts for the walking of your spirit. We're praying that you stir up our hearts to take in the word and mix with faith that it may profit us. To the honor and glory of your name. In Jesus' name. Praise God. This morning I look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Our main text for today's uh, study, such scripture study, Matthew chapter 16, and I read verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair or fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. And the Lord said, O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? Verse, uh, sign of the times, that's verse 4 now. It says, A wicked and adulterous generation uh, seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. We look at verse 5. And when the disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. And verse 6, then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of a Pharisee and the Sadducees. Verse 7. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. I want everybody to read with me verse 8 again together. Let's read verse 8 together, everybody. Which Jesus perceived, or when Jesus, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. I read on verse 9. Do ye not understand, neither Remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up. Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up. How is it that ye do not understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that the Son of Man am, am I am, basically? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, and all, one, all one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of a living God. Read verse 17 with me, people of God. Verse 17 together, everybody. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjuna, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. I read verse 18, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now I read verse 20. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We see in this passage, it all started with the Pharisees seeking and Sadducees seeking for sign from heaven. 
And then afterward, we see Jesus warning his disciples to beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, science seekers. The disciples themselves misunderstood what Jesus was saying, or what he was trying to get across to them. And they thought he was talking about physical bread, but he wasn't really talking about physical bread. He was talking about the bread of life, something that will nourish them spiritually and keep them alive in their faith. Their lack of faith and spiritual perception we find here prevents them from grasping the deeper meaning of the warning of Jesus. And then Jesus said to them, verse 8, let's look at verse 8 again. Let's read together verse 8, church. When Jesus perceived, he said unto them, what did he say to them? O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. So we find here loss of spiritual perception. There was really no, uh, they were not perceiving what the Lord was saying. They were not aware of what Jesus wanted them to note at this very instant. He had just finished with the Sadducees, finished with the Pharisees, still speaking about spiritual perception. He said you could read signs, you could know the weather, you could tell all these physical things, but you do not have a grasp as far as understanding spiritual things. And so we find here for the Sadducees and the Pharisees an extreme case of spiritual imperception. Uh, but then we come over to the disciples themselves. We find a lesser degree of uh, spiritual imperception. There was much more perception, but they were not fully getting it. Much more advanced in terms of spiritual perception than those of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And then we're going to look at this, the context of this, and for better understanding, under three subheadings, I'll just take them one after the other. We're going to see faithlessness born by spiritual imperception. And we're going to see faith for spiritual, spiritual perception. And lastly, we're going to focus on the faithful reward for those who have spiritual perception. Let's look at the first thing. Faithlessness, born by spiritual imperception. Uh, let's look at that place again, Matthew chapter 16. Uh, look at verse 5. Here we see, when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. Then Jesus said unto them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the reasoned among themselves saying, it is because we have taken no bread. And which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye little of little faith, why is ye among yourselves? Because ye have brought no bread. We find here Jesus establishing a link between the problem of spiritual imperception with lack of faith. They couldn't understand, but then he turns to them and says, your faith is small. Your faith is not adequate to grasp the debt of spiritual matters in this case. Spiritual imperception or the inability to understand or perceive spiritual truth is a theme that Jesus addressed multiple times in his interactions with his disciples. Several factors we find in scriptures contribute to spiritual imperception as we can also excavate from the teachings of Jesus Christ. Let's look at some of the causes of spiritual imperception. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4, verse 14. Mark chapter 4, verse 14. Turn with me to Mark chapter 4. We look at verse 14. Praise God. The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately. Can I hear it say immediately? And take it away the word that was sown in their hearts. I actually uh, jumped quite a number of uh, verses 
But this was a parable of the sower. Talking about, if you look at verse 3, it says, Hacking, behold, there went out a sower to sow. For the sake of time, we're just looking at the interpretation of this parable of the sower. So the sower went out to sow, and it came to pass as he sowed. Some fell by the wayside. The fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Some fell on stony ground, verse 5, where it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. And when the sun was up, it was scorched because it had no root. It withered away. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield. I would say, and others fell on good ground, did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. And the Lord ended by saying unto them, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. The use of the ears that is associated with spiritual, it's physical perception. The use of the eyes is associated with spiritual, a physical perception. The skin and the senses of man are associated with physical perception, material perception, the conditions of the weather, the temperature around, what's going on. Where there's no vision, you don't see people, you don't differentiate colors. The human physical senses help us to tell what goes on and what's happening around us. But in the same note, spiritual senses are much needed to understand spiritual messages. Here the Bible, the Lord said, whoever has ear to hear, let him hear. In those days, the Lord would speak a lot in parables, coded messages, coded words. For those who have faith, for those who are surrendered and those who are ready to learn, not meant for at times everybody, and there are times it was very plain, except a man be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. There are other times he had to communicate with his disciples in deeper, using deeper, deeper parables. But here we find in our main text, that the Lord said to the disciples, faithlessness, little faith, you need to do better with respect to your faith. So we find here many reasons. Let's look at that same place again, Mark chapter 4, verse 14. The interpretation, you can read the whole parable later on. Verse 14, we see here the Lord said to them, let's read verse 14, the sower soweth the word, verse 15, everybody, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Verse 16, everybody with me. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they've heard that the word immediately receive it with gladness, verse 17. In themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the world's sake, immediately they are offended. Verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, lost of all the things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Verse 20, everybody. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word and receive it. I bring it forth fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Praise God. So we see here many reasons are linked to lack of spiritual perception. We find here unprepared, unconditioned, unnurtured hearts. When there's an unprepared heart, unconditioned heart, heart that is not conditioned by faith, conditioned by the word, conditioned by grace, 
there will be no result. We see here the hardened heart. The Bible talks about the hardened heart. The hardened heart is impermeable. If you think about a hardened soil and the nature of it, we find, we see resistance to water permeating through it and not giving rise to fruitfulness. In this same passage, we find a wayside heart. That sort of heart that when the word of God is, so it says, when the seed is sown on the heart, it doesn't go in. The birds of the air show up immediately. Satan shows up and knocks, takes it out. And that heart is not fruitful. That person with such a heart is not fruitful. It also talks about the thorny heart. The heart basically that receives the word and then the deceitfulness, the cares of this world arise at the same time and chokes the word. It is, is it that the word of God is impartial? No. Remember, this same word is the word of life. This same word is very creative. It's the same word that brought the very world in which we're in into existence. This same word has got life. The letter may kill, but the spirit in the word produces life. This same word is very creative. And can I tell somebody here today, I have some good news for you. That this world is going to create life in you in Jesus' name. Can I hear a louder amen? amen. Can I hear a bigger amen? amen? If you believe this word, I want you to shout amen. amen. We'll see Mark chapter 8 verse 17. What are the reasons why people fail to see? Lack spiritual perception. Can't hear and understand. And, or perhaps hear and they cannot remember. Jesus says here, Mark 8, 17. Jesus asks, do you have eyes but fail? He says, do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember? Let's look at that place, Mark chapter 8, verse 17. Make sure you turn with me to Mark chapter 8. We look at verse 17. Here the Bible says, and when Jesus knew it, he said unto them, why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? Having ears, hear ye not? Or do ye not remember? When I break the five loaves among the five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, twelve. Who was Jesus referring to here? Who was he addressing? He was talking to his disciples, and he mentions the word hardened heart, hardness of heart. Can I, ever, can I ever say hardened heart? Today you're going to break up your fallow ground. I say you're going to break up your fallow ground. You know, we are in a time that people have actually grown in, you know, this hardened heart. People now have itching ears and uh, not receiving the truth that comes from the very word of God. Let's look at that same place, uh, Mark, same chapter, Mark chapter 6, verse 52. Mark 6, 52. Causes of spiritual imperception. Mark chapter 6, verse 52. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. Here the Lord is saying that the people did not consider the miracle of the loaves. The miracle worker himself, the work of faith, the work of life, the substance from the word. I would think that someone who wants to grow in spiritual perception and wants to sustain spiritual perception and outlive the food, outlive just one instantaneous miracle, will give more attention to the workings of that miracle, the way the miracle came to be that he brought food out of nothing. He fed a thousand multitude from just five loaves or seven loaves, as the case may be, few fishes. I would think that someone who wants to live longer, continue in a sustained approach in spiritual things will focus on the miracle worker himself. And Jesus said, you still have hardened hearts. I pray this morning that none of us will have hardened hearts in Jesus' name. Another reason why people lose spiritual perception 
even though they're in the kingdom. Now, we're not even talking about the Pharisees. We're not even talking about the Sadducees. People who are science seekers. Unfortunately, let me say this to you. Unfortunately, many Christians have also become science seekers. They run after miracle workers. Uh, they run after people to even to the extent that they cannot even differentiate or discern when people are using trickery and using mystical means or arranging, of course, to perform miracles or perhaps arranging miracles. Even their eyes cannot even discern. Like somebody was being accused recently and said, how come all the wheelchairs are brand new wheelchairs and people are jumping off from their wheelchair? How much was invested in those wheelchairs? If somebody has been on the wheelchair for all through life, you will think the wheelchair should be rusty, looking corroded. The wheelchair, the tires should be looking a little bit. Now turn to your neighbor and say, open your eyes. Tell them to open their eyes. They didn't hear you very well. Turn to your one the other side. Say, open your eyes very well. Now tell them, I mean, open your spiritual eyes. Even the devil, if he has his way, will become an angel to deceive people. And you will not be deceived in Jesus' name. I say you will not be deceived in Jesus' name. People become spiritually insensitive. They lose spiritual perception. When they are preoccupied with food. Now, let's put it in a more uh, formal way. When people are preoccupied with material world, the materials, the materials. Praise God. Those who are preoccupied with materials will see more of materials when they read the Bible. They read Genesis, they're going to see more of materials when they read the uh, Genesis. And when they move to Exodus, they're going to see more of prosperity only when, of course, when they read Exodus. Even when the Bible warns that God is a consuming fire and come out from sin, and it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God, they will still see more of material things in those scriptures. It's all signs of spiritual imperception, loss of spiritual sensitivity. Let's look at that, please. Mark chapter 8. I read verse 17, verse 14 again. Mark chapter 8, verse 14. The Bible says here, Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the sheep with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed. Take heed means take heed. Can I hear me say take heed? If someone is warning you to take heed, it infers there's danger lurking around. If somebody is wanting you to take heed, it simply implies if you have spiritual senses alive and you've not been taken over by the spirit of materialism, you understand there's a warning, there's danger to avert. So says, take heed, beware of the living of the Pharisees and the living of Herod. And this morning we're made to see that these are the false teachings, things that can surmount the faith of those who are not steadfast. Let's look at another reason why there is spiritual imperception. The influence of sin and worldly values. The influence of sin and worldly values. Start with me to John chapter 8 verse 43. John chapter 8 verse 43. John 8 43. Why do ye not understand? Where there's spiritual imperception, there's lack of understanding. Why do ye not understand my speech? even because he cannot hear my word. So you cannot hear my word. Jesus was telling them, that you cannot hear my word is the reason why you don't understand my speech. Verse 44, ye of your father, the devil, of course, addressing the Pharisees and Sadducees, your father, your devil of the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. And the, the unfortunate thing is this. The fortunate, unfortunate consequence of loss of spiritual perception is you will believe with a lie. A lie sold to you by the devil using men. And the Lord was saying this to them, I don't want you. That was actually a warning. 
to come out from spiritual imperception. May I say this greater demand is placed on everyone who lays claim to tasting of the grace of God. The disciples had tasted of the grace of God, and greater demand was laid on them. The Lord was expecting much more from them. The church is expected to be distinct from the world and its drives. And the Lord was expecting more from his disciples to understand the voice of the Spirit, to understand the desires of Christ, the warnings, the Son, the warnings of the Spirit, which they were not at this time discerning. The Romans chapter 2, verse 11. The Lord is no respecter of persons. The same way he warned the Pharisees, he comes over to the disciples, he warns them the same way. No respect of persons. The Romans 2, 11 tells us that with God there's no respect of persons. Persons. For there is no respect of persons with God. Can I hear everybody say that? There is no respect of persons with God. With God, it doesn't work with your record of being in the church for X, Y, Z number of years. With God, it doesn't work with you give your life to Christ, uh, you count and say 50, 30. The duration of your actually being in the kingdom. Every day he expects you. He expects you not to be conformed to the world. He expects you to be transformed. Can you ever say transformation? He expects daily renewal. Can you ever say daily renewal every day? He expects growth every now, every moment. Every day you will flourish in his court. Every day you will tap in from where grace comes from. Every day you will anoint your head with oil so that your cup can run over. Every day. Can I ever say every day? Can I hear everybody say every day? If they, uh, listen to this. If the devil himself was a respecter of duration or proximity with Christ, he would have respected Judas Iscariot. He drove Judas Iscariot because of uh, pursuit of material things to the extent that he did not even know when he made himself a willing vessel in the hand of Satan to crucify Christ. Yeah, the prophecy had been given, but there had to be a willing vessel. But he made himself a willing vessel. And I pronounce to you today, by the grace of God, by the virtue of, virtue of grace, you will not be a willing vessel in Satan's hands, hand, Jesus' name. Now say that for yourself. I will not be a willing vessel in Satan's hand for Satan's plots in the name of, the name of Jesus. That same Romans chapter 2, we, two, we look at 16. Romans chapter 2, I read verse 16. The Bible says, In that day, when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, I shall act to my gospel. Verse 17. He said, Behold, thou art called a Jew, and rested in the, in the law, and make it thy boast, boast of God. Here the Lord is addressing, he said, You claim to be a Jew. You claim to have proximity with, with God. You claim Abraham as your father. You claim the, the whole inheritance is all yours. And he said, though you make your boast in the law and you rest yourself in the law, you make your boast by the virtue of the fact that you first got associated with the, this great God and God used you as this epitome of, of deliverance, even from Egypt, as a shadow of what he will do for even the Gentiles. And he says, and knowest his will and approves the things that are more excellent, being instructed of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind and a light of them which are in darkness, verse 20, that's Romans 2, 20, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, we see here which had the form of knowledge and of the truth of the law, verse 21, that thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself, Thou that preachest a man should not steal, does thou steal? The Lord was speaking to his people, speaking, to, and is still speaking to the church today. Thou that says a man should not commit adultery, does thou commit adultery? That abhorrest I, that, that say uh, that everyone should abhor idols, does thou commit sacrilege? Something even more grievous. Thou that makest I boast of the Lord, through breaking the Lord, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. I pray that the name of God will not be blasphemed. 
because of my life or because of your life in Jesus' name. As I pray, the name of the Lord will not be blasphemed because of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We also see here, as well stated, the Lord said to the disciples, there is inadequate faith. Inadequate faith. And this is inadequate faith to face new challenges and situations. They had just learned about faith through Christ, feeding of the thousands, but in this situation. And this wasn't the only case of Jesus who kept repeating, this faith is too small. You need to increase your faith. You can look at later on, Matthew chapter 16, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, still talking about faith, Matthew 17, 20. Jesus said to them, because you have so little faith, through I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And you know, they have failed to do, of course, to, to, to let's look at that place, Matthew 17, verse 20, Matthew 17, turn with me, verse 20. Verse 14, when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's a lunatic and so vexed. For oftentimes he falleth into the fire and oftentimes in the water. And I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. What an embarrassment. Quite embarrassing. In fact, the people that brought them to the disciples, they thought by association the disciples would replicate what Christ was doing. And so they thought by being the pastor's secretary, the secretary will also be doing what the pastor is doing. They thought by, just like many will do today, think by being the one who opens the door for the minister to get into his vehicle should be anointed at least enough. And you know, ministers of today, they have a lot of people opening their doors for them left, center, right. And here they were thinking, they will get something. Maybe it was so difficult to get to Jesus at that time. And so, because of the, perhaps the line and the crowd. And so they said, let's try a lesser option. By association, we think something should happen. And they got to the disciples and they got a shocker of their life. What an embarrassment. They could not do the miracle. And it was on that premise that the Lord said to them, your faith. I look at verse 20. Verse 18. Jesus, of course, rebuked the devil. And well, let's read verse 16. For sake of emphasis. And I brought him to the disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless. And perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? And how long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and the devil departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could we not cast him out? And Jesus said unto him, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove things to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Can I hear everybody say that phrase? And nothing shall be impossible unto you. I want you to say it again. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now say it for yourself. And nothing shall be impossible unto me. Can we really say we're there? Can I hear everybody say it again? And nothing shall be impossible unto me. So why are you obsessed with material things? Can I ever say it again? And nothing shall be impossible unto me. So when the Bible says, first, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things shall be added unto you, can I ever say this again? And nothing shall be impossible unto me. It will come to you. When you put your priorities right, it will literally come to you. Don't you never say it will literally come to you. What people labor for, you will not labor for. Here is the disadvantage of laboring for material things. You suffer heartbreaks. You will get offended. When those who promise you are not able to fulfill the promises, 
Some of you are very upset with your parents because they did not leave any inheritance for you. And then you go around the society and you find other students, they are not on student loan and debt because of some generational wealth passed down to them. They come into the classroom more cheerful, but you come in laboring, burning candles in the night. Yo, why me, yo? I wish. Don't you anyone say, can you come out from wishful thinking? Can you come out from wishful thinking? I mean, I even say this to our children born in this country. I mean, can I be a little rude to you all today? You can't sit down, just sit down there and do nothing and all our brethren are coming from Africa on full scholarship and you're here taking student loan don't you ever say change your attitude wake up let me hear you very well say them wake up Maybe you're helping me to preach this morning tell them wake up to your inheritance in Christ the Lord said you will be the head and not the tail Above only and not beneath. If that faith is working for people elsewhere, who have nothing, nowhere else to run to but God, and I as such was me, many, many years ago, I was helpless. No one to help. I will cry. Lord, if only you will give, you will give me opportunity to manifest my potentials. I will serve you. But I didn't just sit back and back and do anything. I remember very well one day in the minister's house where I was living. There was this man, this minister that came from the United States of America. And everybody was running helter skelter to pick cookies that are left over on the table after he's done eating. Literally, I'm not trying to exaggerate here. <laughs> Chocolate. Well, if, you, if your own case is American chocolate, I need something more than American chocolate. And people will be running helter-skelter. But I would not run or race with them to seek for attention. And I remember I was even labeled at that time a postmaster. I would mail letters to Australia, to UK, to the United States, everywhere mailable. Because I didn't want to be in a system that chokes potential. And I will pray and I will fast because I believe that God was able to do it. But it was then I learned to wait on God. I prayed myself through to revelations and spiritual awareness and perception. I prayed myself until I began to see airplanes in the dream. I saw a particular plane in the dream written scholarship. My father then said, Let's head to the tarmac. You belong there. Get in. I got into that plane, written scholarship. And the plane, and I zoomed off to a place I did not know. It was not too long after that. I had suffered many rejections. But I got a letter from somebody who was my namesake from the United States. He said his name is Charles. He said, I've got some good news for you. But before then, I told you about a minister who was coming and visiting to come and minister in Nigeria, and people were running after. Let me come back to that point. He looks at me. So one, one, one day he looks at me and said, young man, what's your name? I didn't go to him. He said, what's your name? And I said, mention my name. And he said, oh, wow, wonderful. What can I do for you? I did not ask for $50. I didn't ask for $100. I wasn't interested in those American chocolates. So I'm looking for, looking for show. And there's an examination I'm trying to write. It's called a GRE examination. And I've been saving to try and write that exam. So don't worry. I will register that exam for you. And that was how he returned. He registered for graduate record exams for me. And I read myself through, and I studied, and I believed God, and I did well in that examination, examination praise God. Yeah. But help, it was a one-time help, and I got the most important, important thing. 
It was after that, of course, I got a degree in from the United States that scholarship for me. And the same thing I saw in the revelation. You call it dream, I call dream, I call it revelation. Any dream that comes to pass in your life is, was a revelation and materialized re, uh, revelation. So for me, for me, it's, it's revelation. I got into that plane and I landed here in the United States. Here am here am I in the United States of America. Can we congratulations? My prayer for, prayer for you is that the Lord will wake up your spiritual awareness to what is most needful for your life. He's done with feeding the thousands. At this moment, he's talking about deeper tr truth. There's some depth that you need to, con to connect with life. There's certainly, as even as I speak to you this morning, there's something, something God is drawing attention to. That he wants you to, fo to focus on at this moment. You will give yourself, I can tell you that, that you will come out from that situation. So there will be a turnaround for you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I said there will be a turnaround for somebody here in the mighty name, mighty name of Jesus Christ. Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3, verse, 3, verse 2, Hebrews chapter 3. I read verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3. I'm really taking some time to read some scriptures because this is really what you can run with. Hebrews 3, 12, the Bible says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Lest in departing from the living God. You know, when people, unbelief sets into the heart, it sets the stage for backsliding for Christians. It sets the stage for compromises. For, for Christians. When that e, e, unbelief, unbelief, the Bible calls it an evil heart. You, heart, you call it, it's like, I don't know how I feel today. I think, I think, I don't believe God can do this for me. The Bible calls it an evil heart. heart. Because an, a heart that will, that will end to backsliding. It's a, it's a heart that take you back to Egypt. It's a heart that will make you compromise. And God forbid, be you die and compromise, you might, you will not fall. It's a heart that is men, men get you enslaved again. Who told you cannot overcome those temptations? That thought telling you, you that you can be victorious. I rebuke it this morning, morning, mighty name of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. Can I hear somebody say, Christ I, Jesus. say I am a victorious person. Grace makes me victorious. I am victorious by Christ, I am an Christ, Jesus. By Christ Jesus. Grace makes me victorious. Jesus overcame the world and I am a by Christ Jesus. Overcome. Jesus no overcame the world that and is uh, coming to you that is not uh, that is uncommon to man. There's no temptation that is Jesus that coming to you that is man not, not, uh, that to, to show us man. how man needs Jesus to man overcome man the forces of nature. To show us how man well, needs, needs, needs to man feel, to feel, to feel how man feels. Nature. He became so man to have a connection with man. To so man, man can have no excuse like our father, our parents, parents have a in the Garden of Eden. So man who can have blaming no his wife, like the wife, father, father, our parents in the Garden and, of Eden. And then who was yeah. blaming his wife, the wife, blaming one another? The, the, the state and, and Jesus the, wants the, um, you to look away from the downfall one of man. Jesus wants He's come to show us the way to succeed. The downfall of following him. Can I ever say manifestation? Some of you are not saying it. I think maybe 
your spiritual awareness needs to work. Can I ever say manifestation? It will come to you in Jesus' name. I say it will come to you in Jesus' name. Spiritual blindness is another thing. John chapter 9, verse 39. John 9, verse 39. Turn with me to John chapter 9. We look at, we're going to read from verse 39 to 41. John chapter 9. I read verse 39 to 41. If you're there, praise the Lord. Are we there? John 9, verse what? 39. Let's read together verse 39, everybody. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see might not see, or see not might see. Let's take that again, verse 39. I think I need a better glasses here. Now read verse 39 again, everybody with me. And Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see now, I think I belong to the first class. Lord, help me. Help my blindness. Tell, can someone say, God, help my blindness? When you don't have the vision, you cannot see what comes ahead. Danger meets you unprepared. Danger will not meet you unprepared. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Now, wonderful people, let's read verse 40. Finish up verse 40 and 41. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? You, why are you asking such a question? Lack of spiritual perception. Can you ever say lack of spiritual perception? If you have spiritual perception, you should, the questions you don't ask, you just follow your knees and say, Oh, Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips. Like Isaiah. We're in the midst of people of unclean lips. Just want to hear the word. It's the word that will lead you to eternal life. The word that will deliver you. From Sodom, the world that will deliver you from spiritual death. No, no, it's no time to be asking questions. So are we blind also? Why not say I'm blind? And let the restorer of vision give you vision. Somebody's getting vision back today. I said somebody's getting vision back today in Jesus' name. Verse 41, wonderful people, let's read. And Jesus said unto them, if you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remain. God forbid that for me. In Jesus' name. Oh, see, that was the case for them. And there are other people, as I move to point number two, there's other people's familiarity that get too familiar, over familiar with God. Now, please never get over familiar with God. He is a consuming, he's a loving God, but a consuming fire. May you never get familiar with God to the extent that you don't reverence him. That you don't obey him. You are going back and forth with him. And many have grieved the spirit of God. And now they are just blowing like fans have been unplugged from the wall. The fan is still rotating, but the blades. But in reality, plugged out from grace. I will never get familiar with God to the extent that I cannot honor God in my life. Honor God with my obedience. Saul, you were nothing. He says, Saul, you, got, you were nothing. I pick you from nowhere. Now you say, honor me before the people. Who are you? And God said, I'm done with you. I'm done with you. And God went and picked a shepherd boy. While he was still on the throne, there was a replacement for him. You can tell, lack of spiritual perception, he was fighting to retain position. I mean, if you're truly honest, I'm very serious with your Christian life. Put position, let position stay one way. And walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. Can I ever say, walk out your salvation with fear and trembling? That's what the Lord is calling us to do today. That we that we may not remain in spiritual imperception. We look at faith for spiritual perception. Matthew chapter 16, verse 6. Matthew chapter 16, we look at verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Verse 7, the Bible says, And they reasoned among themselves, say, It's because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, 
Why reason ye among yourselves? Because ye, is it because ye have no bread? Verse 9, do ye not understand? Neither remember the five loaves of the 5,000. And how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the 4,000. And how many baskets ye took up? Verse 11, everybody read with me. How is it that ye do not understand that I speak it not to you concerning bread? That ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. The faith we're talking about here is a lens, like a lens through which we perceive spiritual truth. What is this faith about? It's a godly faith. It's a very simple faith. Honest faith. It's a faith that is not conditioned by human opinion. And sometimes you can tell when that faith is present. It does not matter how many erroneous preachers have come your way. Your faith still is anchored on the word. Today, there's a whole lot of faithlessness. You hear one preacher say, yeah, you can do the era of tithe is gone. Do you dig into the word of God to look for yourself? You say, yes, you jump with that. You hear another preacher say this. So, they has been tossed to and fro. Many are tossed to and fro by this prevalence of preachers, ministers who are coming in the name of Christ. And one thing is not those people. The problem is not those people. The problem is really people have left the reading of the Bible and left the scriptures itself. And they have settled for drive way, drive through food. People are no longer preparing themselves, giving themselves to the reading of the word of God. They're looking for quick fix, quick words, positive words, words that are motivational. They're looking for quick, 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 quick. The world is now in a quick, quick, quick phase. And so people are now seeking for people to give them what they want to hear. But there's something I have come to understand about God. And I see, of course, that in the scriptures. That his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. As the heaven is far from us, so are his ways far from our ways. Uh, a minister can come and just only saw a little bit and then makes it a blanket thing. But the unfortunate thing is that when their eyes are even opened a little bit more, they are so proud that they cannot come back and say they are sorry for insufficient evidence or messages. And so many people are gullible and they run with things that may not even be meant for them. Forgetting that God is not man. Can I ever say that? God is not man. And man will never be God. His ways are so far away. So far, we're talking about the creator, the supreme being that created the universe, that created the oceans, that we, could, we can't even tell the limits of these oceans. We're talking about the supreme being, a great God that created the universe, created the heavens, whether the first heaven, second heaven, or third heavens, that we've never even been to. We're talking about a God who puts mountains in place, a God who makes things to come out of nothing. Have you ever wondered who planted the, the, the trees all over the forest and Amazon and everywhere in the world? Have you ever thought about that God who put things in place? And you're just one of those creation. Have you ever thought about this great God? How great he is. How great he is that he chose to send his only begotten son to us. We have thought about God who controls life. When he says it's all over and there's nothing, there's nothing any doctor can say to you that can reverse it. Except, like Hezekiah went to God and said, please, consider me. Have you ever thought about that God? Who wakes you up in the morning, you go to bed at night. Don't get familiar with that God. Too familiar. That you don't honor him in your life. I pray God will wake us up again. It is when we're woken up that we can say we're revived. Else we are 
not. And we're woken up to attend to him first thing when we wake up at the best times of our life. You don't wait for when you are already spent. Your energy is gone. And you're drunk with sleep. That's only when you remember God that you want to pray. At the prime time of your life, the prime time of your day, you're giving it to God and you're saying, God, I'm fresh. And I want to hear freshness from you. I want to get freshness from you. We're talking about separating ourselves from the craziness that drives our society today. Driven by craziness. Get rich quick. Succeed overnight. And that thing is coming. The families don't even have time for devotion anymore. People don't even have time for their personal prayers anymore. God is going to wake us up again. God is going to revive somebody here again in the name of Jesus. This faith is one that trusts in the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6, that trusts in the Lord with all the heart and does not lean on its own understanding and acknowledges God to direct his or her path. This faith gives priority to hearing God's word. The Bible says in Romans 10 verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This faith is a faith that comes through grace. Ephesians 2, 8, verse 9, this faith is promoted where there's grace. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Everything we get from God is a gift. Even the very life, the basic life that you have is a gift from God. At times, you understand better when you walk by the wards in the hospital. Then you understand that this is really a gift from God. That you can walk, you can move, is a gift from God. The Bible said, remember your creator in the day of your youth. When there's still energy, not when old age is come and you have no more strength. This faith brings about increase in spiritual perception. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It is, without it, it's impossible to please God. This faith is like giving a vote of confidence to God. You say, God, I give you a vote of my confidence, oh God. I, I, whatever you tell me, I'm fine with it. It's okay with me. Just, you know, this, this, this is the type of faith I'm talking about here. We're not talking about people assuming the role of God and acting as if divinity rests on them. We're talking about people who are humble, like Paul, who will say, if God wills, I will see you there. We're just, that's the type of faith we're talking about. People who say, if God desires, if God makes it possible. I mean, I, mean, I don't see any preacher who, I mean, maybe we have, only God knows who is as tall and high in spiritual matter like Paul, who was once sort of Tarsus. We're talking about faith that is anchored on humility. That's the faith we're talking about today. And Jesus said, look at the outcome that comes from such a faith in Mark eleven twenty two. 22. Jesus answering says unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto these mountains, O mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Verse 24, the Bible says, Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And Luke 1, 37 says, nothing for with God, nothing shall be impossible. Nothing stands as impossible to those that have faith, this sort of faith in God. Nothing stands as impossible as those who fully entrust their life to God. And so Paul said, well, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Let's walk by faith, not by sight. Before we pray, we look at that place again, Matthew chapter 16, verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto them, we're talking about faithful reward for those with spiritual perception. Matthew chapter 16, verse 17. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, 
for my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Can I hear everybody say the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? Can I ever say the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? No, he was talking about, uh, talking to an individual here. Jesus was talking to Peter. Upon you, you, you will be a foundation, you'll be a pillar. It means you will not die before your time. It means you will, sickness, you overcome. You're going to overcome sickness. You're going to overcome setbacks. You're going to overcome compromise. You're going to overcome adversity. You're going to overcome persecution. He said, upon this rock. Can I ever say, upon this rock? Ah, of course, upon that rock. Jesus is the, is the chief cornerstone of that foundation. <laughs> upon this rock. A rock that will not fail. I will build my church on the gates of hell. The gates of hell. Except you're built on that rock. No, many people are oblivious to the forces that come from hell, the gates of hell, militating against the kingdom of God. But today we prevail in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I said we'll prevail in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I want you to say, I will prevail in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. As we seek to pray, I want you to understand that, yes, the Lord talked about feeding the multitude and the disciples were a little bit carried away with that. But it's important we understand that Jesus himself is the bread of life. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He tells us in John 6, verse 35. And I know that uh, you've come in here hungry. You're trusting God for something in your life. You came believing the Lord that you'll be fed today. I want us to rise up on our feet as we go to the Lord in prayer. I want you to say, Lord, I've come to you. I've come to you. I've come before your presence. I've come to you. I've come to you. The Lord was rebuking at another instance the people. He said, your fathers, your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and they died after eating those manas in the wilderness. But he said, here, this is the bread that has come down from heaven. Say, I am the bread that has come down from heaven. I've left physical things. I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread that will bring sustenance for your life, your spiritual walk with God. I am the bread that will bring freshness to you. I'm the bread that will bring salvation to you. So I'm the bread that's come down from heaven, which if anyone eats and will not die, I am the living bread. I came down from heaven. So whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, he said, and which I will give for the life of the world. Now I want you to evaluate yourself. What is your state of spiritual perception? What's the level of your spiritual awareness? Where are you at this point in time? Where exactly, how do you rate when it comes to understanding how God works? Where are you? Where are you? Your Christian walk with God. Is Christ your chief cornerstone? Is he the foundation of your life? Is he the Lord of your life? I want you to speak to your father. Speak to your father. Speak to your father. He said in Psalm 118, verse 22, Psalm 118, verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Have become the cornerstone. The cornerstone. You need a cornerstone. A cornerstone. That's the metaphor. A cornerstone to give you a sense of direction spiritually. A cornerstone. In ancient buildings of those days, the cornerstone was the first stone that is laid into the construction of that foundation. Very crucial for positioning, for stability, for that structure. Isaiah 28, 28 16 says, Therefore, thus said the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Maybe someone here is about to make haste. You're about to take a quick decision because somebody offended you or because something, something you, you were conditioned by something that happened around you. Something that happened around you wanted to condition your faith. You're going to say, Lord, this morning, my faith will not be conditioned by anything. My faith will not be conditioned by miracles, the miracles by themselves. My faith will not be conditioned by false doctrines that are out there. My faith will not be conditioned 
by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, by the false teachings. My faith will not be conditioned by persecution, will not be conditioned by adversity. My faith, Lord, will be conditioned by your word. Will be conditioned by your word. Pray for yourself this morning. The Lord said, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious stone. A sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. I believe. Say, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe this morning. Remember, the Lord was talking about unbelief, talking about faithlessness. You said, God, I want your faithfulness now. I want your faithfulness permeating my life. I want your faithfulness coming upon me. Lord, I come to you. And you hear you've not given your life to Christ. You've not started your walk with God then. If you've not given your life to Christ, you're still far away from what we're talking about. But you can come near to him. And he will come near to you this morning. And you can start a relationship with him. And he will begin with you today. Talk to your father. Talk to your father. Talk to your father this morning. Talk to your father this morning. Talk to God and say, Lord, I need you. I need you. Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. Help choir. Righteousness, oh Lord. I need you. Lift up your hands and sing with me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour. My righteousness, oh, I need you, oh, Lord, I need you, I need you, Lord, I need you. Father, I need you. I've never walked through life before. The last tens of years gone may not be the same as those coming later. Last year is different from this year, oh God. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. I never lived through the future. Every I need you, Lord. My righteousness. My righteousness. Yes. I need you. Sing it. about to take a hard decision you've never been through that process bro you need him every hour now sing with faith sing with faith this morning sing out with faith because your red sea is going to part sing with faith because your mountain is going to move sing with faith sing with faith this morning
You're my righteousness. You're my righteousness. Not my old filthy garments. Say it like you mean it now, Lord. I need you. Oh, I need you, Lord. And every hour, I need you. Never get familiar with God. Moses got too familiar. When the Lord said, speak to the rock, he took his and acted otherwise. Don't get too familiar with God. Tell him you need him. You need him. You need him. my shepherd I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, not because of my parents. For his name's sake, not because of my wealth, not because of my position, not because of my accomplishment. For his name's sake, Yet do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. Please, Lord, Lord, thy rod and thy staff, they are meant to comfort me. Even if it appears painful, it's because I'm aware of the pain. I want to be aware of your rebukes. I want to be aware of your chastisement, not just your love. I want to be aware of your corrections, oh God. It's the child that the father loves that he corrects. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour. Every hour. I need you. I need you now more than ever before, God. If you don't show up, I may not sustain. I may not continue in the faith. If you don't show up, I don't have the capacity to continue, Lord. If you don't show up, Lord, compromise will set in, Lord. If you don't show up, I don't have the ability to sustain myself. I don't have the ability to climb the mountainside. How can I even cross the Red Sea? How can I, with Pharaoh behind me, and the Red Sea ahead of me, with the walls of Jericho surrounding me, Lord, how can I? By the strength of arm, nobody ever prevails. The forces of nature, Nobody ever prevails over the forces of nature. Without this power that comes from you, my righteousness is your righteousness, my righteousness. My righteousness is nothing. Oh, I need you, Lord. Lord, I need you. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I want to announce to you, Mr. Death, I will not fear you because Jesus conquered you on the cross of Calvary. Because the Lord is with me, his rod, his staff comforts me. He prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. That's why I need you. Oh, Lord, I need you now. I need you. Oh, I need you. Now, there's a place I cannot get to with you. But I trust that the Spirit of the Lord will begin to the spirit of a living God will begin to get to that place. The spirit of a living God will attend to you. The inspire of the word, the spirit of truth, 
He's called the comforter. Father, do that which no man can do. Reach your people now. Speak to their situation. And if you're that man, that woman, just open up to the Lord. Open up to the Lord. Open up to the Lord because your deliverance has come. Let his spirit have its way. Through the barriers and the roadblocks. Lord, where there was once hardened heart, you permeate the heart. You make the trees to grow on barren land. You make water out of the wilderness. What sort of hardened heart can't you soften? And this morning, I release your people, your God, I release your people to you. That the hardness will soften. Your permeation for salvation. There will be deliverance. Life will come in. Revival will come in. Restoration will come in this day. That those who say they don't see their signs again will begin to see their signs again. If we are not alive spiritually, then Lord, we are good for nothing for your kingdom. We can only be fruitful when we respond. The word says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of your word. We are children in your hand, Father. We desire the sincere milk of your word. That we may have the spiritual perception and life come back to us. For in Jesus' name we have worshipped. For in Jesus' name we have worshipped. For in Jesus' name we have worshipped. You are our defense. You are our righteousness. Come to our rescue. Come to our preservation, O God. Wake us up. 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 Oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ. There is an onslaught from a pit of hell. We know it's the pit of hell. We know the devil is at war against the church. And we're not ignorant of his devices as individuals. But we've come to see, O oh God, that you are banner, you are righteousness, you are defense. You can keep us, you can shield us, you can shield our souls. And we want to ask you today that you shield our souls from every influence from hell in the name of Jesus Christ. That our faith will go from strength to strength. Don't allow our faith to die. Father, nourish us in the name of Jesus Christ. The so faith comes by hearing and hearing of your word. Help us never to get tired of hearing your word in Jesus' name. Thank you, King of Glory. As we leave your presence, we want to plead that this new week that we enter, that your presence will continue with us. Father, take us through the week. That when we meet again for the next event, we will come with newness, refreshness, and with life. And testimonies in Jesus' name. With testimonies in Jesus' name. I said with testimonies in Jesus' name. With divine connections in Jesus' name. With abundant life in Jesus' name. With fruits in Jesus' name. With open doors in Jesus' name. That every mountain that had been up to this point, we will find them moved in Jesus' name. Thank you, King of glory, for we know you've had us. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed.
Can somebody shout hallelujah? Now I'm going to make you do some exercise. You're going to shout seven mighty hallelujah today. Hallelujah. 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 Come to see me after service and ask, Pastor, why did you shout seven hallelujahs, please? Or expect me to say shout seven hallelujahs next time. Praise God. Praise the Lord. We've come to the end of our service today. I trust that the Lord has visited you. I pray that his blessings in your life will remain permanent in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to... Uh, we want to... Before we, We're going to share the grace in a moment. Before we share the grace, we want to recognize the presence of one of our pastors in the house. Did he make it? Okay. Praise the Lord. Our pa pastor, incidentally, has the same last name as our leader of the Pastor Dada. continue to be with you in Jesus name and your coming to the United States will be marked for good in Jesus name God bless you again amen praise the Lord praise the Lord now let's rise up on our feet I what's happening next Saturday I say what is happening next Saturday amen I thought the roof will move What time is the wedding on Saturday? 10 a.m. in the morning. Please be here on time. Uh, if you don't come on time, you may not get space. We'll put you in the overflow. So make sure you're here on time. And uh, we trust that the Lord will perfect, make it a worthy occasion. We'll celebrate life that day in Jesus' name. We pray that those who are traveling from far and near, the Lord will bring them safely in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's share the grace in fellowship. The grace for our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Now turn to your neighbor and say, Surely goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life and you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.
as long as Jesus tarries, as long as you live in this veil of darkness, in the shadow of darkness, as you are still in the world here, you keep on beholding because you set the Lord before you all the time. And then you say, when I awake, I shall awake with thy likeness. And then when eventually that day of resurrection comes, when the day of rapture comes and the Lord is calling his own home, you awake in his likeness as for me. Make up your mind. As for me, I will not look back. As for me, I will not backslide. As for me, I will not allow anything to make me go back, turn back. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied. It will satisfy you. It will supply your need. It will saturate you with the blessings of God. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. That's point number one. We're coming to point number two now. Point number two is the perception of the triumphant strength of our rock. He is our rock. You know, when um, Peter gave testimony to who the Lord was, Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He builds you on the rock. That rock has strength. And they were told the rock that followed them was Christ. That's First Corinthians chapter 10. It says all those people, they, uh, they got water out of the rock, miracle water out of the rock. They got supply of abundant water of life out of the rock. And the rock that followed them is Christ. He is our rock. Look at uh, Psalm 18. We're reading from verses 1 and 2. In verse 18, verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. Look at verse 2. Because in verse 2 it says, The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my rock. He is my fortress. He is my deliverer. He is my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. As we perceive, as we comprehend, as we understand, as we gaze at the Lord, our rock, and we behold this triumphant strength. We're looking at three things. Number one, the triumph of our mighty deliverer. The triumph of our mighty deliverer. We're looking at Psalm 18, verses 1, 2, and 3. Verse 1, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. And then in verse 2, it says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, quite a lot there, and my God and my strength in whom I will trust my buckler, my horn of salvation, my high tower. Hold on. In that verse 2, look at that verse 2, and look at the various descriptions of God, so that whatever your situation, and whatever your peculiarity, and whatever your challenge, you will find that God is the answer, that the Lord is the solution, is the rock you can hide in that rock. Is the fortress, and no enemy can besiege that fortress and overcome. And once you are hidden there, your life is secured. It's your deliverer. Even if the enemy has you, if the lion has you in the teeth, in the jaws of his mouth, the Lord is able to deliver. He is your God, the creator of heavens and earth, who created the whole universe, is able to recreate your life. He is your God. He is your strength, no matter how weak you think you are, in your weakness, it becomes your strength. In whom I will trust is my buckler, is my shield. And whatever is thrown at you, that buckler and that shield will protect you and prevent every harm in your life. He is the horn of your salvation. The horn there stands for power. The horn, you see the horns of the of the animals, they use that to fight and they use that to conquer any other animal that will attack them is for power. In the power, in the horn of thy salvation, and he is my high 
town. You remember, it says when the enemy comes, the righteous runneth into that tower and is safe and is secure. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, I will call upon the Lord. The psalmist is talking with confidence. He's not saying, well, I'm going to pray. I don't know whether the Lord will answer or not. I'm going to pray. I don't know whether the answer will come or not. He was sure and you ought to be sure that our God is a loving Father. Our God is a loving God. Our God is a loving Redeemer. He will answer your prayer. Even today, even today, whatever you open your mouth to tell the Lord, the Lord will surprise you with a miracle. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. He will save you from all enemies in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 74. Luke chapter 1, verse 74, it says that he will grant unto us. You can put your name there. I can put my name there that 